thank you very much, Atya. And thank you to everybody who's joining us this afternoon for a wonderful session um, on the last day of what has been an incredible conference. Um, and we hope that even though this is a post-lunch session, we're going to be able to keep the discussion lively enough for everybody to be awake and interested throughout the next hour. Um, I want to say a quick hello to my, to my fellow panelists. Um, such a pleasure that, that you're all joining us. I'm going to introduce them in a bit more detail in a second. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit more about why we are all here today. So as Atiya set us up um, to think about what um, we're going to be talking about today, transforming education, transforming education systems, in fact, the what, why, and how of it all. When we look around the world today, when we see the pace at which this world is evolving and the challenges that we are certainly starting to see emerge, but our children are going to inherit in a very, very full-blown way. We look at inequity, we look at poverty, we look at unprecedented disease, we look at climate change. And with that comes unprecedented opportunity as well. I think the question that we all ask ourselves is, are we ready for this? And are we ready to get our kids ready for this? Are we preparing them through our education to meet the moment, the moment that they're going to be living, the world that they're going to be building? And so to think about the, these questions in a bit more detail today, we have among us um, some incredible people. And so I'm going to start with, with friends who are joining us virtually first. So we have with us, first of all, Mr. Mark Barber, who is the Head of Qualifications and Partnerships at Oxford AQA International Qualifications. Mark, hello. Good afternoon. Mark Good afternoon. Is, the, is, is, is as part of Oxford AQA, which is the fastest growing international exam board globally, and a joint venture between Oxford University and AQA. Mark was previously the Head of International Business Development at the Center for Evaluation and Monitoring. And he has also served with Cambridge Assessments International Education as regional manager for Sub-Saharan Africa. Previously, he has held posts in ELT and the rehabilitation of young offenders with the Prince's Trust, the charity of His Royal Highness, King Charles. Welcome, Mark. And we move Thank now you. to Jenny Lewis, also on the screen right next to Mark. Jenny is an experienced national and international consultant and provides leadership coaching and facilitation for international, national, and state education systems to develop innovative, performance-focused, sustainable practices that cultivate flourishing education systems and schools. Jenny has led systemic and organizational reviews and reforms across a wide array of education subjects throughout the Middle East and Asia-Pacific regions. She's currently completing her PhD and identifying signature designs in high-impact programs for principal preparation, certification, and registration. Welcome, Jenny. Good afternoon. And now, turning to our panelists who are joining us in person, and we're so, so pleased to have them here. And we move first to Janita Anderson. Hi, Janita. Janita is currently the Asia-Pacific coach and consultant as well as the Director for Higher International Education at Franklin Covey, USA. Serving in the organization for fo over 14 years, Jenny has had um, the experience of working closely with Dr. Stephen R. Covey himself. And then she's, she's worked in several capacities at the organization, including marketing, global publishing rights, program and product development, and research projects for the Leader in Me practice. Prior to joining Franklin Covey, Janita has worked with the Brigham Young University, as well as been a freelance writer and PR specialist. Hello, Janita. And now we turn, of course, to Dr. Sabina, Khat uh, sorry, Sabina Khatri on my left, although as accomplished as she is, she, is, she should have an honorary PhD by now. Um, Sabina <laughs> is the founder and chairperson of the Kiran Foundation. Hello, Sabina. This is a non-profit organization that has been challenging norms and paradigms in Leari, the city of Karachi, since 2004. Sabina has extensive experience of working in some very hard issues, including um, uh, working with women and children who have been affected by domestic violence, abuse, and neglect. She laid the foundation of the Kiran school system as a preschool that is based on principles of trauma sensitivity and early childhood education and care. 
Her unique approach of making mother's education mandatory for all students has transformed the lives of many, many children. For her work, Sabina received the Sitara Imtiaz, which is one of the highest civilian orders that can be bestowed by the Pakistan state. She serves as a board member on, on several organizations, including Hands and the Mohammed Foundation. Welcome, Sabina. And we move now to our esteemed guest, Professor Dr. Grouse, OBE. Welcome, sir. Um, Dr. Grouse is the first global director of education at Kidzania and the founding CEO of the Children's University. Beginning his career as a teacher, as all smart people should, um, Dr. Grouse later worked as an education advisor, a senior inspector, and director of education, serving on several boards um, and, uh, and, and advisory councils, including BETS Global Education Council, the Junior Achievements Worldwide Global Council, the Beacon House School Systems Advisory Board, Dr. Grouse is the recipient of the Global Education Leadership Award and is an honorary officer of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, OBE, for his services to children. Welcome, Dr. Grouse. So we're going to kick off and, and get things started. Um, and my first question to our panelists, and Dr. Grouse, we'd, we'd start with you if you wouldn't mind, is, when we're thinking about education priorities for the future, how do those differ from the education priorities that we've seen in the past? I knew that, salam alaikum. Firstly, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Secondly, I knew that I would get the first question, uh, which is always the difficult bit, isn't it? Um, um, I think the answer to your question is however we want them to be. We, we mustn't assume that because we had certain priorities yesterday that we can just play around a little bit with them and that they are more or less the same priorities tomorrow. We need to ask ourselves, I think as, as educators, as leaders, we constantly need to ask ourselves the question, why do we do this? Yeah, and I'm being told quite a lot of times globally that the reason we send children to school is to get them ready for the world of work for it. Well, I happen to disagree. I'd quite like them to go to museums and libraries and, and appreciate the arts and music and be decent, good people. So, so I think we try to do a little, we should try to do a little bit more than get them ready for the world of work. Of course, we all serve an economy, but we also all serve a society. And I think we need to be really clear about that when we set our future priorities. So it's, I think it's a dialogue that we always need to have, and I kind of see it a little bit as a job description and a person specification. What is essential and what's desirable? And then, of course, one size also doesn't fit all, because what is essential in Pakistan and what is desirable in Pakistan may well be very different to elsewhere in the world. And indeed, what is essential and desirable in Lahore might be different to what is, a little bit at least, to what is essential and desirable in Islamabad. So I think we need to take a wider view, and rather than just say, oh, this is always, I get that's the other one I get, and I quite like it. People say, 65% uh, of all the jobs that our children will be doing don't exist yet. How do they know? <laughs> so who's got that crystal ball that tells me that 65% is that number? And my answer to that very often is, the iPhone 3 was launched in July 2009. We were having exactly the same conversations then. Who are those young people going to be who will be doing all those technology jobs? We're not bad at making those things happen. We're not bad at responding to economic needs. We are bad at responding to the personal, the desirable. We are bad at putting decency and integrity and the truth first. Because in the end, that's what will shape us. And then finally, there are two things really, very briefly. One is, we are at, at a time of mass versus individual. One might argue that the priorities of the past were m mass education. Our world is becoming, through technology and in all sorts of other ways, much more individual and we need to recognize that in our future priorities. We need to recognize equity and equality. 
all that nonsense at the moment that technology will save the world will only become less of a nonsense if we recognize that in my city of Sheffield, there were schools during COVID where 35% of the children had no internet access at home in the sixth richest economy in the world. Don't talk to me about the glitz of technology. Don't talk about good tech. Talk about tech for good. And that starts with an infrastructure. Otherwise, the gap between have and have not will, will be the gap between can and cannot, and it will grow. And finally, the title of the conference, Guardians of the Future. I, I like it very much because I think that is our job description. Right? That is what we're here to do. The motto in my wife's school is every child is everyone's responsibility. And I think that's a good place to start. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Grouse. I think you've set us up um, on a very honest path in this discussion. You're, you're pulling no punches here. Um, and we'll move now. I, I'd love to hear, Jenny, what is, you, what is your take on this? So I um, totally agree with what has already been said and, and I am also very grateful for the invitation to be here today and the host Beacon House. Um, so I referred back to the UNESCO 2020 analysis of what was happening as a result of, of COVID and what was the impact globally in emerging and developed countries that we needed to take note of. And so I thought I'd work on, uh, talk, quickly talk about eight points that they surfaced. And um, in asking the question, what have we got to do differently? Well, some of the things that we were doing pre-COVID weren't done at all, at all well. So what, what do we need to learn from that? And what do we need to build on in terms of better practice? So COVID laid bare really um, uh, a lot of pre-pandemic in inequities were either known or ignored or not known, particularly in education, health, social and economic circumstances. Um, for our students and those um, looking after them, whether they be the community parents or educators. It revealed that workplaces and schools that were supposed to be technically strong and connected weren't. And we'd just gone through a decade of the emer emergence of, of what was supposed to be Industry 4.0, in which top technology was supposed to save um, and, and solve the inequities and inequalities of, of many, many nations. And we know that that did not happen. So how do we look at this now, two years post uh, UNESCO's first questions on this? Of course, the uh, technology was identified and in connectivity was identified as failing everywhere. And so what was thought to be a successful solutions and, and countries doing quite well and delivering this space completely failed for everybody. So we have not thought that through well, um, whether it be in emerging or a developed country and not considered that this does not have to be one-on-one -on -one solutions that communities and, and regions and families are, are part of this solution. So, but the, the future question is, how do we ensure that, that students in our schools have access, equitable access, um, whether it be at a community or school level or an individual level? Um, how do we ensure their safety in, in, in an emerging technical world, if that's what it's going to be? How do we make sure it's available for everyone, everywhere, at any time? And what the, would this look like in terms of sustainability? question that I'm, we are working on in a number of countries at the moment. We also found that many educators did not know the students that they were teaching. So when it came to finding out if the students were safe, um, even though they were isolated and, and thinking they were with their families, we found this not to be true. And so there's big questions now as we move into a more progressive future, we would hope that we have reconsidered what schooling is um, the role of teachers and, and school leaders in that role, not only for students' learning, but also students' wellbeing outcomes, and that we ensure that every student is known by their teachers and every teacher knows their students. We noticed through, during COVID that social connections were, were missing. Um, students grieve for the school and their peers that they had lost connections with. 
So as we continue to move forward, the future question is how do we continue to celebrate and recognise that these students like to work in, uh, in socially connected worlds? And from, from little ones and preschoolers, how do we make this ensure this continues to happen if there were to be, God forbid, another, another tragedy? But these geographical and global tragedies continue. So how do we start to think about that? Um, and to think even deeper about this, we, we, now, we knew before but have not really done well in considering transition points for students, students from home to school, school students from primary to secondary, students from junior primary to senior, uh, ju sorry, junior high school to senior high school. All those disconnects for students. Now that we know that, if we didn't know before, how valuable uh, school is for students' safety and learning growth. How do we continue to maximise that? What we identified was that many, many structures were inhibiting learning. Um, we, there was many things that were continued to be main, maintained during uh, COVID that were being questioned beforehand, but this was amplified during uh, COVID. So what I mean by this, there were... Uh, unnecessary parts of curriculum that quick teachers and schools quickly chopped because when they, they knew they weren't the relevant learning the students needed at this time. And in some countries, curriculums have been halved as a result of the learnings of, of um, COVID. So it's the viable and, and relevant curriculums for the students to continue to progress. Things like um, high stakes testing uh, couldn't be done. And so lots of healthy conversations about what assessment looks like and its practices and possibilities have continued to emerge during COVID and post-COVID. And that's really thriving a new community of thinking around what that could be. Um, things like, um, where does a student have to be to be learning? So there was, there was places where attendance was mandatory, um, continue to, to be those old structures. And so, is a student learning when they're not um, in attendance and in front of a teacher? So those sorts of things have started to be thought about. We know that a lot of secondary design and university design was, was broken before and became completely broken during COVID. Um, so what is it around secondary school design and university design that we could start to think about in a more creative and successful way? Um, that would actually continue to ensure equity and access for every student so that every student is successful. And most importantly, the centrality of leadership, it's shown during COVID, whether it be policy makers um, or those in district offices. But the leaders were the communities, the teachers, the educators and the students themselves as they drove their success through times of great challenges and continue to do so. So how do we put the oxygen back on our, our, our leaders in our schools and in our list and our, our systems so that those people can continue to work on these questions? So all the learnings that have uh, surfaced during COVID and all the considerations and thinking of what's important, relevant and purposeful for children continues to be worked on and the less relevant things are now either discarded or recreated in new ways for children's success. Thank you so much, Jenny. And I think, um, I think you, you're really reminding us that before we can start to think about designing for students, I think we have to be asking our question of, do we know our students? And you're talking about that at the level of mm -hmm. educators, but I think it just, of, of educators in the classroom, but I think it applies just mm -hmm. as much and every example that you've shared of good, good practice um, being developed or good response being initiated, I think, has answered that question first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for putting that front and center. Yes, um, and I want to come now to Janita, if I could, um, and, and have you share with us how you see tomorrow's education priorities. It's interesting to think about tomorrow's priorities because tomorrow comes so quickly. Um, when I think about the future, I think, okay, it's later tonight, right? And things move so very quickly in our world. It's a fast-changing world. And with that comes uncertainty. Um, I think we'd like to think that we can 
we can predict, we can be certain about things and then plan for things. And the reality is um, that we live in a very fast changing world. It's also very exciting and there are a lot of opportunities that come in this kind of an environment. I mean, if we look at what just happened with the pandemic, it turned the world upside down, right? It affected every school, every teacher, every student, every family. And so when I, what comes to my mind is really how um, the capacity that we have to be able to move quickly, think quickly, and rethink things. So when we talk about transformation, often that comes with changing paradigms. How do we shift our paradigms? And what we've learned through the pandemic is that we're capable of doing that. It was remarkable what educators did in the midst of the pandemic uh, with, with really, uh, if we stop to think about it, we could really think, did we really do that? And how did we do this, you know? Now, there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of anxiety, there was a lot of pressure, there was a lot of, there was, it was hard, it was difficult, right, to, to say the least. So when we look at our students right now and we really step into their shoes, really understanding their needs. And um, I love this quote by Muriel Summers um, who said that we only get one chance to prepare our students for a world that is mostly unpredictable. There's some things, of course, we can look at and prepare for, but, um, and what are we going to do with that one chance, right? That chance that we have for a child in a classroom and the, the sacred responsibility that it is, you know, with every child. And as we've been doing our work around the globe based on Dr. Covey's work around the seven habits of highly effective people, what, what we're finding is we're all saying the same things, um, essentially, that um, our children need more than academics. Like, academics, of course, is foundational and will always be fundamental, right? And whatever systems we put in place, technology, curriculum to support academics, of course, we'll continue to do that. And we know it's not enough. And so we, we hear a lot about we need uh, soft skills, right? And really now we're seeing that soft skills are power skills. They're not so soft. They're those essential life skills, leadership skills, whatever you want to call them. They're different names. They go by different names, but we're saying the same thing. We refer to them as leadership skills. And Dr. Covey's work around the seven habits of highly effective people is really a framework for human development and for developing leadership. And the whole framework of the seven habits is really about moving us from dependence to independence to interdependence. So the ability for our children to learn these key habits. Um, habit one, being proactive. Can I be responsible for myself? Can I learn the skills of responsibility, meaning that no matter what's happening around me, I know I have a choice. It may be a limited choice. It may be a small choice, but I can make that choice. And that's how we get our power. Um, developing those skills for uh, being in my circle of influence rather than my circle of, of concern. Because no matter what's happening around me, the choice is, what am I going to do? How will I respond to this? And, and having that ability to take initiative and be resourceful. Now imagine every child being able to do that no matter where they are around the world, no matter their socioeconomic status, whatever it is, being able to, to get that skill and that belief in themselves. And then beginning with the end in mind, having a sense of vision around their lives and who do I want to be? Rather than living by default, really designing my life and having clear goals and, and understanding that I can set goals. And not only that, but I can achieve those goals. There's a process for that. And that creates hope. If we can give hope to our children with a sure framework, with key skills, a, a mindset, a skill set, and a tool, a tool set that I can take charge of my life. There may be limits, but I, there's still something that I can do and rather than um, you know, being victim to circumstances or whatever it may be. And they're hard conditions, no doubt. And that idea of putting first things first, of 
setting priorities around what matters most. Our children are very distracted. Technology is wonderful, and it also takes them hostage. You know, social media and, the, and what creates the, the mental, emotional distress that media causes. You know, they think about when you grew up. You know, it was hard enough, right? Growing up years is hard enough. Think about being a child right now. Think about being a teenager right now. It's a different brand of living. And then being able to really get along with others in the way that, you know, we think win-win because it, it's, life isn't just about me. It's about mutual benefits and how do I do that? How do I get the thinking in my mind that there's diversity in the world and that's not a bad thing? Because our world too often is too divided, even in our own neighborhood. How do we value differences? How do we celebrate differences in a way that says, oh, you see it differently. Oh, you worship differently. Uh, you dress differently. I dress differently from you. That's a beautiful thing. That's not a threat. But we, we continue to make it threats in our lives. And, and seeking first to understand, then being understood, empathy. Think about the role of empathy in our lives. Can we really listen to someone else to understand them from where they're coming from? Suspend our point of view. Put it aside for the moment so that we just stop to listen to understand somebody else and then express my thoughts in a very highly respectful way. Imagine our children being able to do that with each other and at home, within the walls of our home. Think of the friction sometimes and the dysfunctions at home that can create problems for, for parents, families, and children, and the disconnect that can happen. And then that idea of we can work together and collaborate, and it's not just about me, it's about you. You bring your ideas, I bring my ideas, and together we're going to create something that neither of us knew when we first started. That synergy that comes, you know? And, and finally, balance in life. So often we, especially as adults, have set a bad example, I'm afraid, for our children. You know, how often are we distracted because we're on our phones? Or, you know, all the, the things that pull our attention. Are we taking care of Good our health yeah. and, <laughs> and what and we're doing hinges on um, it. Like in our lives and creating We've that both balance? We've got second question, so hopefully they do the third question and then come back. <laughs> um, our friends, we can hear you on the... <laughs> Coming through. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so anyway, it's whole child education. Yeah. And uh, recognizing that our children are body, mind, um, heart, and spirit. And, and how can we help them find meaning, belonging? Because without meaning and belonging, we, we, it becomes a rat race too often. Yeah. And I think that's where people get lost. So what kind of framework, what kind of system can we create within a school to not only develop what we call leadership in children, meaning can they lead their lives and then lead others by making a contribution and serving others, but it's about teachers as leaders. And how can we build systems where we, we give voice to others in the classroom, in the school, so that we create a new model of, of the way that we learn and the way that we um, we uh, learn from each other, and it's not just about the adult doing yeah. the education, but it's also coming from the students. I mean, so many beautiful things you've said there, Janita, and I think um, one thing that, that I was thinking about as you were speaking was this idea of leadership. Um, and, and going back to what Dr. Grouse was talking about, we don't know what the future is going to look like. When we say something like 65% of jobs are going to be relevant, we don't know. And so actually, because of the uncertainty of the future, um, I think even more important, these ideas of building our children's leadership, because ultimately that is what's going to help them not just survive, but thrive in an uncertain future, and not just as individuals, but as a community. Um, and so, and some of the things that you were talking about with, re with regards to their, their me mental and emotional well-being, I think is, I want to come with that to, to Sabina, because I know it's an area that she cares so much about. So, Sabina, talking about tomorrow's education priorities. Uh, thank you. I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, listening to all my colleagues, I would like to expand on what Janita was saying. However, it just reminds me of uh, one of my students. Uh, she once came to me and she said, uh, 
I wish I was born in your era. And I asked her why. And she said it was so simple, it didn't come with instructions. <laughs> so now there's a but attached to everything. She said it in her own language, in Urdu, so nicely that even if I have to go and meet my mamu, which is my maternal uh, uncle, it comes with a but. Go meet him, but keep a distance. Go meet him, but. So you, she was saying that whatever I hear from you, whatever I hear from my parents, it seems like that your era was so simple, there were less instructions. And that did make me feel really sad because that is true. I mean, like we used to go running around, we used to go to our grandmother's house without any ifs and buts. So I just feel that uh, with, with all that is happening, the fast change that we are looking at, well said, as you said, that tomorrow is right tomorrow, actually. And the kind of inventions that are happening so fast and the, and the, and the things that are going on in a child's brain at one time, they're like just like pop-ups, you know. Everything's open. The, the windows are open in the head. I think they're very confused. This is what I feel. And to help them to see things more clearly, at least I would only talk in the context that I'm working in because I don't think, think that I can advocate for the whole world right now. I'm not as learned as all my colleagues are here. I've worked very closely with the, with the Pakistani children and children who come from lower income backgrounds. And I wouldn't be surprised if even, even the children that we see are very protected, are not going through the same stuff that our lower income bracket is going. The only difference is that I feel that the upper class actually cannot even talk about it. And, uh, and the others, they come out and they speak about it because they are in a place where they feel, what do I have to lose? So might as well just go out there and ask for help. But our elite kids, the, the kids in the bubble, they're not even asking for help. So I feel that if in our country, if there's going to be a huge gap, which is there, I see between the parents and the school, if the parents are going to be invited to school maybe once a month, which I think doesn't happen even in the best of schools, maybe twice or thrice in a year, only to hear how well your child is doing in school or how bad your child is doing in school. It's not a partnership program anymore. It's not one family anymore. I mean, how do we do that? That is really important. And I, when I used to look at all the schools around me, I myself used to get very overwhelmed that I can't change all the schools. So I shut out my mind for a while and I said, let me make a prototype. Let me just try and develop one school so that I can speak about it. it. It's happening. It's been 18 years now. Parents are part of the school family. It's, a, it's not a school, it's a community space, a space where they feel safe, where they feel they'll not be judged. Mothers are going to their own classrooms, they're learning, they're getting aware, children are getting aware, they come together, they do mother-child activities, father comes in, he's spending time in the classrooms. The school, that building, why does it shut down at 2 o'clock or 2.30 or 3 o'clock? Why can't that school be used as a community center till night? We need to make some more efforts, of course, but it, we're talking about our masses, right? Our 90% children don't have the facilities. Everything costs mental health, mental health help. It's only for the elite. It's expensive. How do we provide that to our masses? They don't even know what it means, mental health, zehni sehat. We need to, we need to simplify those jargons. And we need to, to take them to our masses that Zehni sehat, that's what it's called in Urdu. Zehni sehat is, is mental health. And zehni sehat or mental health is actually a very complicated, uh, uh, complicated maybe topic, but actually emerges from being heard. So the family unit, the family system that we used to have before where children could go to grandparents and the grandparents were there to listen to them. It's widening the gap. Can we bring in the grandparents into the school? That's a question. How? It can be done. I can show you how it's done. 
and it's very easily done. And you know what? Once we do it, we actually realize that a teacher that was extremely burdened in the classroom actually now has another 20 helpers in the class who were the mothers. And her burden lessens. So the moms come and spend time in the classroom. Two mothers come every day. And they're the helping teachers in the classroom. They're spending time with their own child. They're getting to know what the children are learning in school. And they're surprised because they're learning every day too. And yet another thing that I feel is that, you know, I'm talking from my context, of our context, of course, that the, the place from where a teacher comes, you know, the control, you know, feels like I can control the child. That will need to change. Because a lot of time I think the teacher will be surprised that the student will know more than the teacher now. And now we will be needing to ask them, okay, so what all do you know? Mm. And let's start from there. So I just feel that, you know, uh, the soft skills that Denita was talking about, and all of us spoke about it, uh, including the mental health uh, uh, knowledge, I would say, the awareness, needs to be simplified and taken to every person to our, in our country. I mean, that, that's what, what really, really frightens me, that with all that is happening so fast, so much validation required for children for every little thing, we see that on social media. Where is mental health going to go? Yeah. Such an important question. Um, I love that it's one that's resonating across the panel. Um, I want to turn now to um, our friend Mark, if he's still with us. We'll come back to Mark um, in a short while. Uh, I think the, the, uh, the, we've talked a little bit about what we want the, the priorities of our education systems in the future to become um, what we think our education systems need to evolve towards. I think my, uh, my question following up from that is, how far are we falling short of that today, if at all? Are we, how, are we doing a, gut, a, a good job currently, Dr. Grouse, of preparing our students for that tomorrow? Yes, I think we are. I think we're doing, we're, we're doing, uh, we're probably doing better than we should do. Because, uh, because, because we care. Mm. Yeah, the, the, you know, the, 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 what, what, what do the teachers and the adults uh, have in common who I meet everywhere? What they have in common is that they, the vast, the vast, vast, vast majority, they care. Mm. Yeah. They want the best for their children, and they work within the circumstances that, they, and I think that's, that's the phrase, right? Within the circumstances that we're given, and quite often we can't help but change the resources, the some of those circumstances, I think we do as well as we can. That isn't to say that we can't do better, of course, but, but if, you, if you kind of evaluate where we are, we have to pat ourselves on the back, also to your point. My, my, my now 17-year-old daughter, then 15, was in school one day and she was in her room behind the laptop the next day. And nobody prepared the school, the teachers, or, or the parents or the children for that. And if you evaluate that, then it is very easy to be critical and miserly quite often, right? It, it, it was a Herculean effort that was undertaken. And, and it was quite right, if I use the UK as an example, it was quite right that every Thursday um, that many people stood outside and applauded the doctors and the nurses. My view was that every Wednesday, everybody should have stood outside and applauded the teachers and yeah. the head teachers yeah, yeah. and all the other people who worked in schools. Because my wife's school never closed. No, for, all the, for all what the press lets you to believe, they had children of essential workers who were there. And they were there all the time. And it was in a, in a, in a disadvantaged area, in a very, these things are relative, but within the United Kingdom, in a disadvantaged area. And the school became more than a school. There were 400 food parcels on the car park every day for the families to collect. So I think the difference that we will see is, is we will need to accept that schools, schools will exist. You know all those futurists who told us that they wouldn't exist? Well, you were wrong. <laughs> yeah? And schools will exist. But what we will see, we will see, I think, schools... I'm a football fan. Barcelona Football Club. The motto is more than a club because the club is owned by the fans. We need more than a school. That needs to be 
what we need to do. At the heart of the communities, making a difference. And back to that motto of my wife's school, which is every child is everyone's responsibility. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, and I think we're doing, and all of the people here over the last couple of days, I think you're doing a brilliant job. Is it perfect? We're not, we're not giving the license to be perfect. And actually, it would be quite boring if we were perfect, wouldn't it? I think all those people who have been here need to give themselves a pat on the back. Sadly, society often doesn't. So congratulations to all of you and all of the people who have walked around here in the last two days. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Graus. That's refreshingly optimistic and, um, and I think uh, such, a, such a great thing to congratulate all the educators in the room. Mark, if, you're, if you can hear us now, um, you I can. can. Thank you. We're back. Hi, Mark. Um, Mark, we're, we're so glad you're back. And we'd love for you to speak to us about what you think the education priorities of the future are. And also your take on how are we doing right now in preparing our students to be able to meet that future? Yeah, indeed. So I'm, I'm sorry to have missed um, the other speakers there. Uh, we were cut out when um, Janita was speaking. But um, to come back to Dr. Grouse, and Sheffield is the city of my birth, sir. So um, you mentioned decent, good people. Um, I think that's a great place to be starting. And that is an educational priority that we can say was relevant in the past and will be relevant in the future. So I don't think it's about throwing everything that was um, we perceive to be wrong in the past in the bin. It's looking at what the good things are, and that's a great place to start. But to that, we need to add the key competencies. Um, as uh, when Janita was speaking, um, you get one shot and that one chance. And I think if you can combine decent good people with key competencies, you're going to give them the best thing that you can do. Now, with apologies to Guy Claxton, uh, Professor Guy Claxton, he talks about the Ice Age learner. Um, that was when we went to school, a lot of us um, of a certain <laughs> age, you were instructed, you hopefully comprehended, and then you were examined. And of course, working for an assessment board, um, we like people to be examined. Um, but the Ace Age learner uh, is that learner that is actively learning is capable of applying their knowledge um, and their skills as well, and are empowered to experiment and, of course, examined at the end. I don't think that's going to change anytime soon, although the way in examining takes place may. Now, if we look at the UK at the moment particularly, there's a real issue with um, free speech and cancel culture. It's happening in the leading universities um, at this very moment. And I think that that's come around because young people, in fact many people, lack an ability to express, to interpret concepts, their thoughts and facts and opinions in a rational, oral form. So to my mind, if we can introduce the core key competencies combinations of knowledge, skills, attitudes, which facilitate the application of knowledge into real-world concepts, what is always referred to as 21st century skills, we will empower people to have rational debate, to be able to learn how to learn, not simply what to learn, to be able to express an opinion, debate that opinion, and these are not just skills you need in university, or employment, but they are, I would argue, absolutely life skills as well. Now, how do we assess all that at the end? Um, I think, as I say, we're going to see some changes, but certainly project-based qualifications and, in, and encouraging inquiry-based learning, um, applying that knowledge into different scenarios, whether that be global warming, which of course is very topical, will help us together solve the problems that the world faces uh, in a much easier way. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I think one thing, one thing that I'm thinking a lot about is, uh, particularly when you talk about these broader set of competencies, some that we've talked about at, at great length and, and others that you've introduced in this discussion right now, Mark. Uh, one question, one big question that I have, and I know we're, we're uh, running out of time, and. We want to give our audience a chance to ask their questions as well. 
But very quickly, I'd love to touch upon this a little bit because there's so many teachers in the room right now. What is going to be the role of the teacher in this future that we're imagining? And Janita, I wonder if you have thoughts on that. Yes, yeah, so um, from our perspective and the work that we're doing in schools, one of the things that we're looking at is helping teachers develop social emotional skills um, and making it a student-centered classroom where, and shifting that, that power structure, if you will, with the teacher being you know, in the front of the classroom and it's more teacher-centered than student-centered, but creating the environment with uh, strategies to really give voice to students, um, using different strategies to help them do project-based learning, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, um, empowered instruction where we ignite curiosity and then it, and facilitate the way for the students to explore and investigate and then make connections using uh, critical thinking stool, um, tools um, to really uh, think through problems or prob you know whatever they're working on to have systems and, and tools and frameworks to be able to think through things. And primarily, as we develop social emotional um, learning, going back to the idea of leadership, and I just want to emphasize that you know, the traditional notion of leadership is, oh, well, that's the position, the person who's in the position, the boss, the principal, the teacher. That's formal leadership, right? And that's one type of leadership. But we're really redefining leadership. And it's really about each one of us as a leader who can lead our lives and then lead others in the way that we live with others and get along with others. Um, I really want to share Dr. Covey's um, definition of leadership, which is leadership is communicating the worth and potential of people so clearly that they're inspired to see it in themselves. So when I look at that, if we were to say, you know, a teacher's role is to communicate the worth and potential of every child in their classroom, and how might I do that? and um, creating that, that, the, the skills so that the students will learn and thrive and, and helping them learn uh, for a lifetime. It's lifelong learning. Can I think independently and critically? Can I think creatively? Can I you know, turn to my neighbor in, in, in my classroom and can we collaborate in a way and help each other learn? I may be good at math and you're not, so let me help you. And a teacher facilitating that so that t the, the students are owning the classroom. Give them leadership roles in the classroom. And the key question often for teachers could be, you know, what am I currently doing in my classroom that I could turn over to the students? Why am I doing all these kinds of tasks or things that I'm doing when I could turn it over and have them own the classroom? And when you own something, don't you take responsibility for it? All of a sudden, you show up to class because you've got a role to play. I just want to share one quick story about this. So there was a school um, in the States. I was working with the principal, and there was a, a, a little boy. We ca we'll call him David. And um, shockingly, he was um, about 12 years old. He had been suspended from school for a whole year. And I was aghast, like, who made that decision? But nonetheless, she had the student come to her school. And he was disheveled, I, you could tell, just isolated, estranged. And this idea of leadership roles, I, I want to illustrate how powerful it is. That principal asked him, David, would you like to do the morning announcements? They had a tradition of getting on the PA system and making announcements, today's Tuesday, da 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 Adults were doing that, right? She turned it over to David and said, David, would you like to do the announcements? He always came to school late and disheveled and uninterested. And on the days that he was asked to do the announcements and he agreed to, on a Monday, guess who would come to school early? Guess who came to school with his shirt tucked in and his hair done? And he showed up because he had something important to do. 
he was making a contribution. He was being seen as a leader. He was being entrusted. And I think if every teacher, everyone in the school can do this for every child, developing leaders one child at a time, you change the trajectory of that child. Think about what that did for David, who had been an outcast. Now he belonged. And now we can learn. When we feel belonging and we feel safe in the classroom, we can learn. We can thrive. So I think um, the, the, to the extent that um, a teacher is willing to have that kind of paradigm in the classroom and model that leadership in her language, his mindset, and the way that he or she interacts with their students and gives them voice, and it's a new day in the classroom, children will show up, and that's where they want to be. That's a lovely story. Yeah. And I'm sure so many teachers have, have experienced this in their classrooms, um, similar stories like that one, um, when you believe in kids. And so, Jenny, going off of that last question and, and still talking about teachers, we have a question actually here from, um, I believe, somebody who works with, with students as a teacher. And the question is, in this unknowable world that we've been talking about, what is the importance of questioning? And how does one um, build that into their, their teaching practice? And the, uh, a layered question that I would ask you on top of that is, how does one develop teachers in order to be able to teach questioning to students? There's lots of yeses in the audience, um, uh, if you can't hear it, just in case you can't hear it. So was that question to me, sorry? Yes, Jenny. Sorry, that was to you. Shall I repeat it? Uh, no, no. So the strength of questioning design in the classroom, is that? Yes. How do you, yeah. you build questioning in, in teaching? And then how do you develop mm -hmm. teachers to be able to do that work with students? Um, well, it, it, it's part of a repertoire of, of, uh, of skills of, of current teaching modelling. And, uh, and Mark uh, talked about the, the, the power schools of, the, of, the, of this century and, and things that we should be looking at and strengthening. But there, there is the skill of, of exploration and inquiry design, problem solving, and designing uh, scaffolded questions that not only the teachers can ask that actually encourage the student um, to think in more complex and perform in more complex ways, but it's also um, uh, the opportunity uh, for a teachable moment for both the teacher as well as the student. So we find typically um, in, in learning design, uh, curriculum design, uh, lesson design, that teachers uh, uh, are skilled more so at asking uh, response, uh, yes and no questions, but not asking students to, um, to uh, evaluate, create, synthesize, all the, all the skills that actually uh, um, become an open-ended opportunity for a student to show their full potential. So in developing the, the skill of questioning, it's something that teachers really need to practice and learn themselves so that the, um, the scaffolding from more easy responses to more complex responses becomes part of the daily design of, of the learning in the classrooms. From a student's perspective, it's something that uh, they need to er er learn from an early age. So instead of just response uh, type questions, as I've said, being able to um, really explore and the depths of the opportunity placed in front of them. So it is a teachable moment for students and teachers um, and one that needs quite um, in-depth training in initial teacher education and ongoing professional learning in the classroom. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, and the next question that we have from our audience um, is, uh, I'm going to direct it to you, Mark, um, if, if you can still hear me okay. Great, I can see you nodding. So Mark, the question we have is, how important are large-scale assessments like TIMS or PISA? How important are they and how we think about what education is going to look like in the future? 
Yeah, I mean, I think these, these global measures have a place, um, but I think as with any assessment, there's a danger that the, the tail can wag the dog, so to speak. And, and you know, Jenny mentioned there that you know, the, the core things in the classroom that teachers are trying to enable learning um, rather than teaching to the test. I, I think ultimately, um, you know, at government level, uh, countries want to perform well in PISA and things like that. And at a school level, of course, particularly in, in you know, certain fee-paying for-profit schools, there's great pressure um, on teachers to deliver A-grade students because that's what the parents expect if they're paying lots of money. So, um, you know, constant testing and memory testing isn't going to be helpful. Um, what we need to assess is, is those critical thinking skills and we as assessment boards need to make sure that the tests are relevant um, and supporting good teaching practice. So how students apply knowledge into different situations, as I say, where often there is no right or wrong answer. And we assess and apply a mark scheme to the way that student has gone about solving the problem, um, even if the answer ultimately is debatable whether or not it would work. I think that is probably the best way is we as assessment boards can move forward rather than looking purely at, you know, you're good at English, you're good at maths or whatever it might be, which um, isn't really going to help us go forward, I don't think. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much, Mark. And, and the final question that we'll take from the audience, we have almost five minutes left, um, but that it's directed to Sabina. Um, Sabina, the question is how you talked about, about bringing mothers to school how exactly are you convincing them to be able to come and spend their days in school? Uh, honestly, I didn't have to convince them. The, I think the first uh, step that we took was to make the space so inviting and safe and beautiful for them that they don't want to go back. So when they come to school, they call it their Mecca. They call it their mother's home. They say it feels like as if I'm in my mother's home. That's how much I'm loved, respected and heard here. So when the mothers come in, we're there to receive them. We, we hug, we sit down. If you come into our school at any time, you'll see mothers sitting, you know, three, four mothers in a cluster sitting there. Children just run out of the classroom just to give a hug to the mother and go back to their classroom. So it's like, and, and it's happening. The schooling is happening. It's not that we're far behind. Our, our kids have reached LUMS and IVM and uh, universities that we feel that we need to take them through a drilling process to reach these universities. No, that's not true. Anything you love, you will do it happily. So we need to provide that safe, you know, havens to the children and schools being those microcosms, why can't we build them into safe havens? And I'm talking about my masses. I'm talking about those children who can't pay a fee. We can provide them these havens if we can take a you know, handsome amount from them. But what about the others? What about the 90% of our children? They don't have it. So I would say you know, converting those government schools, the big schools that are lying barren, they can be converted into just beautiful microcosms. It's just a matter of wanting to do it. I've never had, I've never needed to convince anybody. They just want to come. They can't wait to come. Maybe when I started in 2004 with 20 children at that moment, at that time, it took a little bit of convincing, not much even then, because they knew that we were there to hear them. We never actually uh, offered them a school. We offered them a healing place. So I feel that the teachers now will need to think from that place. Uh, they are counselors, they are caring adults. They need uh, to think like a parent. It's really yeah. important. Yeah. yeah. What a beautiful thought. Thank you. And now the final question that I'm going to ask, I'm gonna, we're going to try and get to all of our panelists, so I'm going to do this really quickly. What is your source of hope? We're talking about a big thing, transforming education systems. What gives you hope that it's possible? Dr. Grouse. Children. Janita. I have to echo that. Um, I think children are such beautiful spirits and they have so much within them. And that idea that every child is born a genius, we just need to get out of their way and just nurture them 
with love and care, you know, caring, creating a place where they can learn and thrive. It's there already. We just need to release it. Thank you. Thank you. What a beautiful thought. Jenny. Um, I, I will uh, endorse what was said, but also to that what gives me hope is when we're present in such learnable moments as this, that we're having uh, teachers, educators, um, researchers, policy makers, parents, community together exploring what is possible and that we continue not to sit on our hands and continue to push the envelope and look at what uh, Antonia Genterra said to us to do, to continue to reimagine and to create a space and place where every student is successful. So um, hats off to those that have organised this, but those amazing school leaders and teachers that are also helping to make this happen. Thank you, Jenny. Mark? I'm going to say teachers. Um, Without uh, teachers, none of this would be happening. And I've heard from the great panelists here, um, and I'm sure all of the delegates in the room there, you're all doing an absolutely fantastic job in making schools more than just a place of academic learning, but a really safe environment which learners can thrive. And I thank you for that. Thank you, Mark. Sabina. I just feel that uh, we all sitting over here we prove that there is a womb somewhere, otherwise we wouldn't have been here. So my belief in the feeling of motherhood is so strong because I've seen it in men, I've seen it in transgenders, I've seen it in a six-year-old child mothering a pet, a 12-year-old sister mothering a brother, and that feeling of motherhood, I mean, like there's so much to learn for it. As long as we are all alive, motherhood is here. Yeah. We just need to learn from motherhood, that's what I feel. It's beautiful. Thank you very much, Sabina. And like many of our panelists have said, I think my source of hope is the collective leadership, the collective energy of people like us, everybody here who's in this room, children, and then teachers at the, at the front and center. And so thank you very much. Thank you to our wonderful audience for engaging. But thank you so much to our panelists who are here in person with us and to our friends who are joining us online. That's the end of our session. Thank you.